Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today I want to take a quick look at this game here, War Chest by AEG. War Chest is actually a fabulous abstract board game for two or four players. Now, I want to specify there that's two or four players, not two to four players. That's actually a mistake I made when I first purchased the game. You can't play this game with three players. You can either play it one versus one or two versus two if you want to try the team's variant that's laid out in the rulebook. Now, when I say it's an abstract board game, I want you to think of games like Checkers, Chess, or Go. Games that are more focused on the many combinations and patterns of moving the pieces around on the board, more so than having any kind of a story or a theme to really entice you into playing the game. If you're looking for a game that has a rich fantasy or a background built up around it, that's not really what an abstract game is. An abstract game is something more like checkers. I've got some red circles and you've got some red circles and we kind of move our circles around by hopping over each other, which I guess sort of simulates murdering each other. And then when you get to the other side of the field, you become a king and you put a crown on top of that piece, which is another circle, and then you can murder in reverse. It's kind of a weird game, but it works, and it's got enough of a strategy to it that people enjoy it. When you want something more complex, you move up to chess, and there you get some more familiar pieces. A king, a queen, a bishop, a knight. These things are slightly familiar, but you still don't really get any story or explanation as to why they behave the way they do. A queen can kind of just teleport all over the board and kill anybody that she likes, whereas a king is stuck in the back and loses you the game if he gets so much as a stubbed toe. So it's a weird kind of game, but people love it because it's got an extreme complex set of different combinations and patterns that you can move your pieces around in. And that's why an abstract game is good, because of that complexity, not because of the theme or immersion. Now, when you look at a game like War Chest, it actually has a little bit of the best of both worlds, in my opinion. And in fact, I'll say right now, this is probably my favorite abstract game that I've ever owned or played. Now, with War Chest, right on the inside of the box, there's a story laid out. And this story is that there is a king in a kingdom long ago who, on the day of his first child, birth, his only heir, many people are coming to the kingdom and presenting him with gifts as a sign of respect. One of those is a friend of his, the general of his army, and the general gives him a small wooden chest, and inside that chest is many coins and a wooden board. And he says, King, this is not a gift for you. This is a gift for your child. You see, you have earned the respect of the kingdoms and empires that surround yours through besting them in battle, but your heir will not be given that respect unless they earn earn it, and they will need to succeed in battle as you have to do so. Playing this game will teach your child the various tactics and strategies necessary to be able to be victorious in battle, even though while they're doing so, they'll think they're just playing a game with friends. They're actually training their mind to be victorious. And this is supposed to be a replica of that gift that was given to the king. So says the story inside the box, which is probably not true, but it's a really cool hook and it pulls you into the game. And right out of the gate, you now have an understanding of exactly what this is. This is a game played by the heirs of kings in order to mentally prepare themselves for the necessary strategies to be victorious in battle. And you'll be controlling various units on this hexagonal grid meant to represent the actual units that would be used in war. That's a lot better than I've got red circles and you've got black circles and they kind of hop over each other, right? Or even, you know, a pawn moves like this, but a bishop can attack like that. I feel like this is a much better setup. And more so than just being more thematic and immersive, it actually makes the game easier to learn because that same sort of realistic storytelling carries over to the pieces. When you look at the different units that you control, unlike in a game like chess where you simply have to memorize a rook moves orthogonally and a bishop moves diagonally and a knight can kind of move in a hopping L shape that you can rotate to fit your needs, these pieces actually move and attack in a very obvious kind of way. Looking at the archer, first off, the symbol for an archer is a bow and arrow. You really can't get much more straightforward than that. If you look at the way the archer attacks, they can attack two spaces away. They can also attack over other units. This makes perfect sense because you're basically simulating shooting an arrow. You can attack at distance and you can also attack over things. Now, when you compare that to something like the crossbowman, who can shoot two spaces away, but only in a straight line and not arcing over other units, that seems to make perfect sense as well, especially when you also realize that the archer cannot make attacks against adjacent units. They don't have a melee weapon, but the crossbowmen can, probably because crossbows often have a dagger or bayonet affixed to the front of them. So it all makes perfect sense as long as you know a little bit about what these medieval types of units actually are. Again, a lancer, for example, can move two spaces in a straight line and then make an attack as part of their movement. 
that makes sense. It's a guy on a horse charging in a straight line with a lance tucked under his arm. So the game makes itself far more uh, reliable, or I should say far more um, available to entry level players because there's not a lot of crazy memorization or abstract memorization that has to go on. Now you are still just moving chips, or in this game as it calls them, coins around on a hexagonal grid and manipulating units in order to control different points, which I'll talk about in a moment. So it is still an abstract game in the sense that there aren't a lot of luscious or glorious pieces or tokens to move around on a well-illustrated graphical board, but because of the story and the theme and the setting, it's a step above other abstract games, in my opinion, and the gameplay is far more enjoyable, as far as I can tell, than any other game that I've played in this sort of same vein. I've played about a dozen games of this or so, I've watched about a dozen games of this between various couples in my friends group, and we've all really loved it. It's been a lot of fun. I've never actually watched a game and enjoyed it as much as I have this one. Except maybe TCG games, but that's a whole different thing. Um, but looking at the pieces that actually come in the box, actually starting with the box itself, like I said, nice little fable sort of written out on the inside of the box explaining the theme and the story of the game. And then inside the box, you'll notice there's very little air. It's a very well-designed box. Once you have this token tray or this coin tray inside the box with its little plastic lid on it, which is also very nicely fitted, uh, the rule book, these sort of velvet-esque bags, though I doubt they're real velvet, the board folded up and all of the different cards for the units, you're left with only about half an inch of air left inside the box, which is a real bummer because that's just enough air that when you tip this box on its side on a shelf, all of these coins are gonna slide out of this tray and end up in a pile at the bottom of the box. If they had only gotten the measurement just a touch closer, you would have had a perfect box that you could travel with anywhere or store however you like, and all of these coins would have stayed in their tray very nicely. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, that's not the route they went, so a little bit of a bummer there. Moving on from the box to the board. The board, very nicely designed, relatively simple, as most abstract games boards would be. A little bit of filigree, you know, around the outside edges to pep things up a bit. Like I mentioned, it's got a hexagonal grid on it. That's where you're actually going to be moving your units around. On the edges of either side of the grid, you're gonna see five browned out spaces. Those are only going to be used in the two versus two game, which mixes things up a little bit. Players get a different number of units. You need a different number of points to be controlled in order to win. And obviously you'll need some extra space in order to fit all of these extra pieces on the board, which is what those brown spaces are for. In a regular 1v1 game, you'll simply ignore those. Now, on top of that, looking at the board, you'll see some green glyph spaces. These are actually the control spaces. Each player is going to start with two of these already controlled, and then your goal throughout the course of the game is to control six of them. As soon as one player controls six of them, they've won the game. Much like other abstract games, the game ends immediately as soon as that happens. The other player doesn't get one more turn to rebut. There's no finishing out the round. As soon as you get six, the game is over. Let's play again. Now, in a two-player game, that rolls up, or I should say in a two versus two player game, that rolls up to eight total points needed to win. But beyond that, I'm not going to talk much about the 2v2 version of this game because I simply haven't tried it yet. It does seem very enticing though. So you've got those green glyphs on the board. Like I said, you're going to start with two. You want to get up to six for the rest of them. Looking at these sort of outer sigils or house sigils around the edges of the board, we have two different houses in this game, crows versus wolves. And you can see that each has two sigils on either side of the board. Now, from what I've seen, and I've read through it a couple of times, the rule book doesn't actually say anything about utilizing these sigils. I believe they're there just for design sake, but I actually have a pretty reasonable way of using them. If you want to, you can use one of your faction or house's sigils for your discard pile of coins and the other for your unused control tokens, which I'll talk about in a moment. But just keep that in mind when we move forward. Those are actually kind of useful spaces. So moving on from the board to the coins, uh, although I do want to touch on one last thing on the board, it's a little seam heavy. And when I say that, for such a small board, it's not even a two foot by two foot board. It's relatively tiny, because it doesn't need to be very big. Um, it's got three seams. It's got a fold down the center longwise, and then it's got two seams across because it's a tri-fold uh, shorter ways. So it's a total of three seams, and that is a bit much for a board this small. It's not quite heavy enough to weigh itself down. And so when you take it out of the box, it's a bit buckled, and you kind of have to counter flex all of the seams, which I hate doing because you just know that one day it's just gonna let go and you've destroyed your game. Though I will say, I actually enjoy this game enough that I've considered buying a nice hand-carved or wood-burned or even 3D printed board to go with this game. Granted, it won't fit in the box, but I feel like it would sound and feel really great with these nice plastic poker chips. 
Moving on from the board to the chips. So they're referred to as coins because of the fluff of the game, but they're basically these nice hard plastic poker chips. If you've ever played a copy of um, Splendor, it's the exact same kind of chips. They're heavy, they're hard, they feel great in the hand. You can kind of roll them around, moving them around on the board. They've got a nice little scooching sound. It's, it's hard to explain, but you know what I mean. Um, and they're just really lovely components to, to work with, to play with. I really enjoy them. There are a lot of games that use them, certainly not ones of this density and weight and quality. These are all labeled with the symbols matching the units they represent, because those are going to be what you use to represent units on the board, as well as to sort of build your deck. This is a bit of a deck builder game, except it's a bag builder game. And instead of cards, you've got coins. Once I go into the rules a touch more, you'll understand what I mean by that. But that's pretty much a perfect analogy for understanding how this game flows. So you've got the coins, all nice, heavy plastic, all labeled with the various unit symbols. There are also some labeled with these symbols for your houses. Again, one for wolves, one for crows. There's actually uh, two for each, sorry, for a two versus two game, because each player will need one of those floating around in their bag, which is essentially their deck. Keep going with that analogy. So the only downside with the coins, much like there being a minor downside with the board and a minor downside with the box, is that there are two sets of coins from this box or from this tray that are cardboard instead of plastic, which is a real letdown. And on top of that, it's the fact that they are the most commonly used coins. It's these coins here that are meant to mark control spaces that you've captured or taken control of. Again, you're trying to get to six to win the game. Each player is starting with two. And these are mirrored across the board via these green sigils. Now, when you play Place these onto the board, you would like to have that same nice clunky, clanky, tactile feeling that you get from the heavier plastic chips, but you don't. They're just a light cardboard. They don't feel as good. And these are the ones that you're going to be placing down with gusto. You know, I, I control here. Boom. That's You really want that like finality of taking control of a point, although it's not all that final because your opponent can steal it right back. But it would be really nice if those were plastic as well. And it's a shame that out of something like a total of 80 coins, maybe 85 coins, 16 of them, eight per faction or eight per house, they went with cardboard. I don't know why they decided to sort of stop short of going plastic all the way. There's definitely room in the box for it. As I mentioned, there's even room in this tray. And frankly, what could it have cost? Maybe it would have raised the cost of the game five, ten dollars. I think it's well worth it to kick any additional cardboard out and go with solid plastic across the board. That would have been really great. But that's it for the coins. Moving on to the unit cards, you can see here there's a card for each unit, a total of 16 different units in the base game. And this game does have expansions. I haven't picked any up yet, though. I am excited to try them because they add things like siege weapons. But looking at what we have here, we've got all different types of foot soldiers and cavalry. We've got a lancer, swordsmen, we've got various types of sort of uh, mercenaries and rogues and spies, different things that you would find in medieval armies and factions, and they all function in slightly different ways. The cards show you the name of the unit, the symbol that's going to be on the matching or accompanying coins, the number of coins that will come with that unit, which varies between four and five, as I can see with the base set, and that has to do with balance out the power that that unit has. If a unit is very powerful on the battlefield, although they're all pretty well balanced, that unit will generally have four coins instead of five, making them slightly less functional because you have fewer coins to activate them or to bolster them. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, five coins if it is a slightly weaker or less amazing unit type. So for example, archers have four and crossbowmen have five because archers are slightly more versatile than crossbowmen. I guess, in the game maker's opinion. Um, so one card for each unit, and that's going to show you how they move, how they attack, any special tactics or abilities that they have, like being able to move and attack at the same time, or any restrictions that they have, like how archers can't attack adjacent units like most other units can. 16 of those, one per unit. Moving on from that, all that's left is we have these bags and we have the rule book. The rule book is short and sweet. Only about half of it is how to play the game. The rest of it is variants on setup, how to do a two player versus two player game, and some sort of unique setups to start if you want to replicate actual historical battles using this game. These bags, like I mentioned, are sort of how you do the deck builder version of the game or the deck builder uh, component of the game, which is that you are going to start with your four, uh, four per player, three per player in a two versus two game, um, units, and you're gonna have all of the coins for those units laid out in front of you. You're going to take your house coin, which is either gonna have a crow or a wolf on it, and you're gonna place that into your bag. You're then going to take two coins from each of the factions that you have, sorry, each of the units that you have, and place that into the bag as well. So you're starting with a total of nine coins, two from each of four units, and one from your house. That's your starting deck, sort of. It's your starting bag. 
from there, as you go through the game, you're going to be placing coins from the bag into your hand at the beginning of every round, three coins per round. And you're going to then be using those coins to either place onto the field in the form of a new unit. You can only have one of each type of unit on the field, bolstering an existing version of that unit. So if I already have one archer on the field, I can bolster it with a second archer coin, meaning it now has two hit points because every time a unit gets hit, it loses a coin. And if you remove the last coin, that unit is no longer on the board. You can always spawn another one uh, if you draw the right coin. You can also discard coins face down or face up in that discard pile. And like I said, it's nice to kind of keep that discard stack on one of your house sigils. Face down, you can do things like add new coins from your reserves into your uh, bag through the discard pile. So again, much like a deck builder, you discard a coin face down that allows you to take a coin from your reserve, add it to your discard pile face up. And then when your bag goes empty, you're going to take that entire discard pile and dump it into your bag, give it a shake. And that's what you'll now be drawing your next three coins from. You can discard face up in order to activate units that are already on the board. So if you have, say, an archer or a lancer on the board and you want to move them, you discard another lancer coin face up to your discard pile. If you want them to attack, that's face up to your discard pile. If you want them to control a sigil that they're standing on that you don't yet control, that's face up to your discard pile. If you want them to use a special tactic, face up to your discard pile. Now I will say, controlling sigils on the board, you're either standing on one that you don't control yet or standing on one that your opponent controls. Um, when you discard face up to activate the uh, unit that's standing on top of that space, you simply place your own token there from your available unused control tokens. If it's one that your, control, your opponent controls, you simply remove their token and then place yours. So you can kind of knock them off and add your own. Um, it's nice to keep these stacked up on the other house sigil space because sometimes you can't see if there's a control point on the field or a control chip on the field. For example, if I take three crossbowman coins here, stacked together, bolstered to three, and I place that on top of a control coin, I can no longer see that control coin. I can barely tell that those coins are even elevated from the board. I actually have to lean down pretty low to even tell that there's a coin under there. And this is why, again, it would be really nice if those cardboard control coins were plastic like the rest of the coins, because not only would it make it more obvious, but you actually could have gone with, or they could have gone with, a silver and gold edge as opposed to the gold or the black border that all of the regular coins have, making it even more obvious at a glance where the control coins were. As it stands, using these cardboard ones, you can kind of lose where they are on the field if they're under enough coins. And that's why it's nice to have the rest of your coins that you're not currently using for control spaces stacked over here in a pile. Because if I can only see one on the board, but I see four over here, and I know that each player has six, I can assume that the other one is underneath that stacked crossbowman. So that's another nice way of utilizing the sigils on the board for your house. So the only other coin that I haven't mentioned is this coin that I have sitting right here. It actually shows one house sigil on either side, one wolf and one crow. That's going to be flipped at the beginning of the game and that's going to be initiative. So at the beginning of each round, that's the player who gets to play a coin first, either onto the board or to the discard, face up or face down, depending on what they're doing. Now that's not going to change in between rounds. The only time that changes is if the active player who is not in initiative or does not have initiative plays a coin face down in order to switch it. If you do that, you simply flip it over to the other side and now you have initiative. Initiative can only be changed once per round, so you don't get into these tug of wars back and forth where initiative just keeps changing hands and nobody really gets anything done. And that's the entire game. There isn't a lot that I have to teach you because learning the game and beginning to strategize with the game isn't that difficult. It's mastering the game that's challenging. And that's true again for most abstract games. If I were to tell you that a cavalry model can move faster than a swordsman, that makes perfect sense. If I were to tell you that a marshal could actually maneuver other units around the field using its tactic, that also makes sense. You can sort of just start to guess what different units do based off of their name. Again, if you have a small amount of understanding of how these sort of medieval European units worked. Um, but that's the game in a nutshell. Looking at a sort of proper review for the game, I would say theme and immersion it's an abstract game, but it really does a great job of making you feel like you're actually maneuvering these units around a battlefield. And because they behave the way that they should based off of their description, it feels all the more realistic. So I would say this is a solid two out of two for theme and immersion. Moving on to cost versus quality, there are a few letdowns with the game. Like I said, the board can be a little funky with how sort of folded it is when it sits in the box and how you have to flex those themes out to get it to lay flat. Um, the coins, great, other than those two types of coins that are made out of cardboard. 
board. A little bit of a letdown there. The cards are fine. The box is nice. Wish it was a bit snugger, but it does fine. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's a two out of two for cost versus quality. It's not absorbently pricey. I think it's a very well made game. I think you're going to get tons of replayability out of it, and you can play it with two or four players. So a good bit of versatility as far as abstract games go. Then we've got ease of use. I would say it's very easy to work with. The main components being the coins are big and chunky, easy to hold on to. You're only ever holding three at a time. The board is small. It fits on almost any table, so you're not going to have to have a massive gaming table or you're not going to have to clear out a bunch of space to play it. It's fast. It's easy to get multiple games in. So ease of use, two out of two. Then we've got is it enjoyable? I would say it's enjoyable for most people, and this is sort of an across the board issue with abstract style games. They're generally 1v1, and it's not the kind of game where you can lose and not feel like you lost. If you lose in this game, you've clearly lost. Your opponent beat you. In some cases, they're going to stomp you into the ground. In some cases, you'll have had no chance. That's just how abstract games are. And you can play them more and you can get better at them, but if you're unbalanced or you're in an unbalanced match against your opponent, it's not going to be a blast. You're kind of gonna get destroyed Hopefully it's not going to take too much time, therefore it's not going to waste a large chunk of your night. But this is definitely the kind of game where you know you lost, like you're, you're well aware of it. And not everybody's going to love that. So I'm going to go ahead and give this game a 1 out of 2 for enjoyable, because I know there's a good number of people out there that aren't in the mood to feel completely defeated by a fun board game. And then lastly, is it teachable? absolutely teachable. Like I said, the rules in the rulebook only fill out about the first four or five pages. It's very simple to learn, and it's very understandable because the story and the theme really lends to sort of like explaining what units do before you even fully comprehend what they do by reading their cards. They just make sense. So out of all of that, we get a 9 out of 10 for War Chest. Very solid game. I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I would recommend that if you have the opportunity, you go out and get yourself a copy, or at the very least, if you find somebody that has a copy, give it a try. I bet you'll have a good time. If you guys have enjoyed this review, I hope you go down below and subscribe and set your notification bell to all. Uh, if you do want a fuller tutorial on how to play the game or if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments down below. Love talking to you guys. And if you really enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you didn't like the video, leave a dislike and that way I'll know that I'm doing something wrong and I can try to improve. Comments tend to help more with that, but dislikes are fine too. Uh, other than that, I hope you guys are having a great day and I will see you tomorrow. Have a good one.